Buying a garment, a dress, a jacket nowadays, uh, the consumer is negotiating a minefield of ethical issues. And as well, included in this negotiation, the designer is making the same choices. And it's this topic that I want to bring you today, the notion of ethics within the supply chain, and ethics, I suggest, are the new black. So those of you who aren't um, fluent speakers of fashion, which I suspect you all are, um, black is important, because black is considered as basically the center point of a fashionable, uh, modern woman's wardrobe. And it's popularized probably earlier on in the early 20th century by Coco Chanel when she uh, brought about the little black dress. And as here you can see a quote by Karl Lagerfeld, who is the current creative director of Chanel, one is never overdressed or underdressed with a little black dress. A little bit of backstory, as um, my colleague said earlier, I come from Oceania, <laughs> which sounds great and I'm sure as heck don't look like it, but kia ora and welcome. But in terms of, I had the privilege of working in Australia and New Zealand. But working in New Zealand, I was working with fashion uh, students, uh, teaching them about sustainability and leading into the notion of the garment life cycle and also the fashion supply chain pauses. So I was there going, it's like this, it's like this. And I thought, I'm a designer, why am I doing that? I'll draw it for them. Oh, hello, we jump forward there, okay. Um, so I came up with a hand-drawn um, hand drawn diagram, trying to explain to them the stages of the fashion supply chain, starting off with the evolution of concept, going round what I call the fashion design production loop, and finishing with disposal. And it's a loop, or it's a chain, because in theory we're trying to do a closed loop a bit, and trying to keep things progressing round so garments are not heavily disposed of. So we've got 13 stages, and very many ethical issues arising from those stages. So, again, being a designer, I wanted to refine it, change it, so it was actually clearer to me to understand. So with the aid of a graphic designer, thank you, Lorna, in Melbourne, um, and my supervisor who said, put phases into it, it's still too complicated, um, I came up with the design phase, the pre-production phase, um, the pre-purchase phase, and the post-purchase phase. A lot of P's in there, tricky for... Uh, audio. Anyway, so we've got essentially 13 stages and we have quite a few environmental, well, sorry, ethical impact situations. So hopefully, come on, techno, oh, there you go. Right, so ethical issues, and there are a lot of them, and there are, there are some very scary -ism isms which we're going to be going lightly through. The ones in bold are the ones we're going to lightly cover because it's a very short amount of time. So we've got 12 ethical issues, and these are decided in the supply chain, whether they come into play or not, by the fact that the garment you're going to be making, the product, the season, and also the range it's within. So bearing these in mind, we go forward. And what I'm looking to explain to you is the fact that this is not a sort of a blame game, it's their fault, it's their fault, but it's in fact something we come together in addressing these supply chain issues and the, more importantly the ethics. And they're both personal, professional and also company-led. So we've got um, the arc, I'm just basically showing you this, this is the top bit we're going to be dealing with, right-hand side being the designer, left-hand side being the consumer. And you've got basically two and a bit phases to be going with. Okay, so designer choices. Now, we as designers, the beginning of everything, everybody knows that. Well, actually, most of us have to sort of step down quite a bit and say, well, actually, no, this is part of the loop. We're inclusive, we're holistic, we're not, it's not all about us. But these are the key first issues that start off the supply chain and the design phase particularly. The important thing is on these is the fact choices made here seed the rest of the supply chain. So you've got evolution of concept, fabric selection, size selection, and fabric utilization to start you off with. Quite big, and again, seeing around here, you can see the issues that come into play. Oh, well, this is a good start picture, and we seem to have a bit of tie-in going on, because um, earlier on, uh, one of our uh, fellow presenters showed a picture of the Rana Plaza disaster, which brought into very tight and important focus the role of labor rights within the supply chain. The fact last, in April 2013, 1,200 men and women died in that building, and people are still suffering from the injuries they incurred. It's not easy to forget, however quickly some people do. But the main thing we tend to come in on is in fact the environment. That's what most people think sustainability, to some degree, ethics are about. 
the environmental impact is decided um, in the first, well, basically 80% of the environmental impact of a product is decided according to European Union research at the beginning of the design stage, which does tend to up up the ego of the designers, but in fact, it gets a bit scary when you start realizing how much responsibility is involved. So pulling back from that responsibility, breaking it down, you're back to fabric utilization and choice. And that's just not what it is, but it's basically how it's grown, how it's made, how it's manufactured, how it's uh, finished, how it's cut, how it's made, and how, is it, how it's worn, and how it's disposed off. So there are a lot of issues in there, and quite a few of the early parts of the list actually happen offshore. So we're taking sometimes our ethical problems and putting them out of sight and out of mind to some people. But trying to bring it back forwards for you to understand a bit more. This brings it back, and again, I'm tying in a space theme as well, no sexy graphics, I'm afraid, but actually sexy pictures uh, by, from NASA. Who'd thought a fashion chick would stand up and talk to you about pictures from NASA? But this is actually really important. It gives you one example of supply chain and things that can happen or not happen well. What we're looking at here is a picture of the RLC. I knew you knew that. Um, basically, it's in Uzbekistan, and it gives you the example of cotton. Cotton under the Soviet regime was uh, planted in a desert, Natch, um, by the Soviet regime uh, in Uzbekistan, and I think also bits of Kazakhstan, but we'll stick with Uzbekistan. So they diverted two rivers from the sea to irrigate the cotton fields. So this is the outcome. So I think, and I'm, I'm not good on numbers, so forgive me, I'm misquoting. So approximately, I think it was in 2007, they identified that the, this closing eyes thinking thing, um, uh, they identified that uh, the RLC was now 10% of its former size. The certain things have been happening regarding to dams, which is bringing back the fish, because there was a fishing industry that kind of shrunk with the sea at that same place. Unfortunately, the whole thing about um, Uzbekistan doesn't quite finish there. They're not unique in malpractice, but um, it makes quite a good a case study. So what happened with them is um, they used forced labor. Now, forced labor is not unheard of within picking cotton. However, they kind of took a new vibe on it. So basically, they closed schools, universities, got the general public, and um, they bust them all in to do cotton picking. So from that perspective, it takes on a, a, whole, different, a, a whole different view, I suspect. Now, under environment, well, and also more importantly about fabric sourcing, we have fur. And basically, fur is the use of a sentient animal skin for decoration and, um, I suppose, attractiveness. But uh, there are two issues relating to the use of fur. The first one is basically the taking of life of a sentient being. The second one is expecting, perpetuating its suffering in capture, you know, captivity while it's being farmed, or worse, illegally trapped. So you're thinking about whether or not to use fur as a designer. We don't use it that so often here now, but unfortunately it comes in and out of fashion. So the other thing I want to include here, which is probably a bit of a oh, surprise, um, is speciesism. A lot of the planning we do in relation to fashion, uh, but also the environment, is all about favoring humanity. So it's important to bear in mind that we are not going to be the only inhabitants um, for the future, and we need to look about and consider all the other species that are out there that are going to need to share the space. Two issues that are of particular interest to me, which are very rarely put into the whole scheme of sus sustainability and ethics, are intellectual and cultural property. Intellectual co uh, property is the work of another designer. Fast fashion means that we need lots and lots of um, images and product for turnover. So it makes it quite understandable, but not necessarily permissible, to take someone else's idea, but it's still theft. And more particularly from living in Oceania, New Zealand, and Australia, two countries with an indigenous people, I'm very aware of the harm and distress theft of cultural property can uh, cause. So what you tend to be looking at and considering is in fact not owned by one person, it's owned by many, maybe a tribe or an iwi or a hapu as in New Zealand. It may be sacred, it may have um, particular meaning that you're not aware of. So it's important if you're considering doing this about finding out more information, learning and consulting with the original people, or 
paws um, using an indigenous designer. Very lucky, helped out by Johnson Witihira, who volunteered to let me have a slide. So this is his uh, New York digital installation in New York Times. And he is an artist working in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, as a graphic designer and as an educator. So you can use local ability rather than doing a version of your own. So this is all about responsibility and theft. So the notion being is if something is environmentally sound, it doesn't necessarily mean it's sustainable. Um, sorry, it may be sustainable, but it isn't ethical if you're actually taking it from someone else. Moving on, back to looking at uh, the arc between the designer and the consumer. Three, er four areas, I beg your pardon, not good at counting. Um, four areas of interest are basically all isms, and they essentially relate to the fact that um, in the designer's sketchbook, when they're conceiving, con um, concepting of an idea, as it were, is concepting a word, who knows? Anyway, the way they depict the image of the consumer, is it holistic, is it a true reflection of our society? Is it looking at sizeism? Is it looking at ageism. So from the idea being if you're doing a small little pale drawing of um, a garment in a very small size, it's going to be quite hard to um, upgrade it to a larger size and make it look in proportion. So these are th four areas that need to be considered as a designer going through. What are you perpetuating? Are you drawing everything on very, very small sizes or very young people or very, very pale people? Essentially, you may be saying to the rest of the potential consumers, you don't deserve good design, which I think is rubbish. Right, the, the isms we uh, seeded earlier on are actually reflected back in the consumer area. This is where the consumer choices, the consumer, consumer ethics have impact. So again, in the, we're, we're looking at isms, and also alongside uh, sexism, we're also considering pornography. Uh, to start us off, we'll look at uh, the notion of racism. If you look at this, this picture is uh, Naomi Campbell. It, she was the first black model on the front of UK Vogue in 1987. Sorry, second black model. Um, the first one have, having been in 1966. So are we reflecting truly of a, the, our uh, proportions of peoples in our diverse culture, or are we just doing slim, pale, undersized, underage people? Likewise, even more scarce are larger women, definitely not on the front of a cover of the major magazines, unless, of course, they're a comedian or actress, and mostly it's um, comedian. So this is um, maybe something we're used to, but when you consider that in 2015, it was uh, reported or measured, as it were, researched even, um, that 20, 40 5% of UK women are size 16 plus. So we're not actually getting a reflection of real society. Um, furthermore, in with the sexism, in with the um, sizeism, you have uh, the notion of use of, I suppose, reflections, references to pornography. Um, Gail Dines is um, an anti-pornography activist, academic working in the US, and she was observing in fashion publications or fashion-related publications the fact that you're getting strange pornographic archetypes. When we're looking at this, we may find it personally t distasteful because we're almost asked to being, uh, be used, kind of involved as a voyeur in the publicity and marketing relating to fashion but also think about the models who are actually quite often young, possibly vulnerable, and they're asked to take place in some of these fashion shoots. Um, so from that perspective, um, people have been organizing, particularly the models themselves, in uh, the US. They started the Model Alliance in 2012, which is basically campaigning, a not-for-profit, campaigning for non-harassment-free environments and also better pay and hours. Back to consumer choices, and you know, how about, you know, how can I stop this? What do I do? It doesn't necessarily mean you have to get on a plane and find people to help them out. Our choices make a difference as consumers. So we're mostly looking at environmental impact, and surprisingly enough, the largest environmental impact within the entire supply chain, within the fashion loop, within the life cycle analysis, is in fact our impact, and it basically impacts on the temperature that we wash our clothes with, how often we wash them, type of detergent we use, and most importantly, oh, it's a strange colour, um, uh, how, uh, what, 
kind of temperature we do tumble drying at. And tumble drying is such a small thing, but it's absolutely huge on the impact. So we've got some really sexy uh, um, sort of research here done by the University of Cambridge quite a while back now. And it says essentially, elimination of tumble drying, 60% of the use phase energy and ironing in combination with a low temperature wash leads to 50% reduction of the global ch climate change impact of a project. Oh, it's hard to read, but the impact is scary. Right. Oh, with all that scary news, we need some heroes. Right in the high street, Marks and Spencers, with their Plan A, huge amount of innovative um, ideas relating to uh, swapping clothes, leading ladies photo shoot, featuring a wide variety of ages and different ethnicities of women, also uh, doing a carbon-free factory in Sri Lanka for making its underwear. Um, if you're going high-end, Stella McCartney, who's been pioneering animal-free product ranges of clothing for some time, or going small, people tree who've been pioneering ethical, uh, responsible, fair trade, uh, environmentally uh, sound clothing for some time. So there's a lot going on there. Essentially, in the few minutes that we spend to buy a garment, we are uniting our ethics with those of the designer. And we need to think quite carefully what we stand for, and where we stand on our choices. In making those ethical choices, in the clothing we design or buy, we link by our ethics, the designer and the consumer. We are giving the garment a longer first life, and maybe many lives. This is one of the problems at the moment we're solving as designers. We're caring from the environment now and then if we make these ethical choices. We're protecting cultural heritage. We're not perpetuating cultural appropriation or colonial oppression by taking someone's culture for our entertainment. We're stopping the theft of ideas ideas. Uh, you find it on the internet, you own a photocopier, it doesn't make it yours. Uh, we're not supporting the sexualization of young men and women. We're supporting the inclusion. It should be including ages, diversity of color, and size in the industry, both here and internationally. To paraphrase um, absolutely fabulous, slightly, maybe it's Jennifer Saunders, I apologize. I'd like to say that I believe, darling, sweeties, ethics truly are the new black. Thank you. <laughs>